All right, guys, we are starting with chapter five from Fort. Um, this is where we left off. So um, this is when J.R. and Maury, we had just learned that they had taught Gerard an awful song. Um, Augie and Wyatt told them, told Gerard, don't sing that song anymore. We're going to help you come up with another one. So this, where chapter five is starting, is when Augie and Wyatt had just left. Um, and they had accidentally slipped up that they were building a fort. So that may or may not come into play later. Okay, chapter five. Can you believe J.R. and Maury? I asked Augie when we were out of Gerard's earshot. Jerks, he said. It's bad enough they torture us, but picking on a kid like Gerard? He shook his head disgustedly. Teaching him a song like that? Jeez. But how are we going to make up a better one? Augie asked. He sounded a little desperate. I don't know, I admitted. We'll just have to think of some words that rhyme and put them together, I guess. I mean, J.R. and Maury came up with those two crummy lines. We can do better than that. If you say so, Augie said, but he sounded doubtful. We just have to get in the right mood. Okay, he said, but first the fort. I was thinking we'd use a tarp for the roof, but then I was thinking it would flap around in the wind and probably leak. It would be better if we could get some sheets of tin or something like that. Let's ask Al, I suggested. My dad told me he used roofing tin to build a fort when he was a kid. Maybe we can find some lying around. When we got to the junkyard, Unk's car wasn't there yet. We found Al sitting in the office at a metal desk, which was covered with piles of grubby papers. Come over here and look at this, boys, he said. Augie and I went around behind the desk and stood next to him. He pointed down at a calendar and opened to the month of July. Now this, he said, I understand. There was a picture of a lady wearing a red, white, and blue bikini, a cowgirl hat, and cowgirl boots standing in the open bed of a pickup truck, a red pickup truck. She was holding a flag in one hand and a bottle of STP motor oil in the other. Augie and I looked, not sure what it was that Al understood, but willing to keep looking. Then Al flipped past August, September, October, and November, and Augie and I caught a quick glimpses of other ladies leaning against cars or getting in or out of cars or pumping gas into cars, none of them wearing much clothing. He stopped at December and said, but this, this I don't understand at all. He pointed a greasy stubby finger at the picture of a lady wearing a very small red bikini decorated with white fur, a Santa Claus hat, and white furry boots. She was standing by the open door of a car in about six inches of snow, holding a bottle of STP motor oil with a big red bow around it. She was smiling like mad, like standing around freezing to death in a bathing suit was the most fun she's ever had in her life. It was so dumb, Augie and I both laughed. I figure Al was thinking the same thing. But he said, boys, that right there is a 1957 Ford Thunderbird convertible with the original colonial white paint job, white leather seats tricked out with white wall tires and custom chrome hubcaps. Augie and I looked at him in surprise. I don't know about Augie, but I hadn't noticed the car very much. Al put the calendar back down on the desk with a thump, sending papers flying in all directions. Now I ask you, he said, what in the name of your great grandmother's girdle is that girl doing taking a car like that out in December with ice and snow and all that, all those lousy drivers, not to mention the salt they put on the roads? I mean, you got to ask yourself, is she crazy? I had to admit that Al had a point, even if it wasn't the first one that came to mind. Totally nuts, I said. Insane, Augie agreed. Al tossed the calendar toward the overfilled wastebasket in the corner. It fell to the floor and he waved at it dismissively. So, he said, you kids going to work on your clubhouse today? Fort, Augie corrected him. Yeah, we got the sides up and we were wondering, are there any sheets of tin or roofing, anything like that out in the yard? Al til tilted his head back and closed his eyes. I figured he was going over every corner of the junkyard in his mind. After a while, he sat up and opened his eyes. I think there's something you can use leaning against the fence on the south side wall. Augie looked at me. Let's go. As we headed for the door, Al said, you might want to park your bikes behind the office here from now on. Keep those two Jamokes, Jory, Maury, and JR from seeing them and bothering you. Good idea, I said. Thanks, Al, said Augie. As I followed Augie out the door, I watched him dip smoothly and with one hand pick up the calendar from the floor. What did I say before? Augie's always thinking. Score, I said as we moved our bikes. Augie grinned, rolling up the calendar, putting in the basket on his handlebars. Gotta have something to read in the fort besides comics, right? Totally, I agreed. Al's voice came booming from the office. And don't think I didn't see you swipe that calendar, smart guy. We wandered around Al's yard. It was interesting. I hadn't figured a junkyard would be organized, but it was. There was a section full of all kinds of different vehicles. A hearse, a good humor ice cream truck, a school bus, an ambulance, and an old rusty hippie van painted with peace signs. Along the wall nearby were washing machines, refrigerators, and all kinds of appliances. 
There was a whole area devoted to wheels, a car, truck, tractor, and steering wheels. I started over to check out some pinball machines and arcade games, but Augie said, over here, Wyatt. I walked past a car that looked like it had come from a funhouse ride. It was sitting all alone, surrounded by weeds, its bright paint faded and peeling. I wanted to check it out, but Augie was pointing excitedly at the stack of cor corrugated metal sheets piled against the fence. Wow, I said. All we need is two or three of those babies and we'll have a roof. A roof, sorry. You bet, said Augie. So that just leaves the front. We could build walls and a door somehow, I guess. Yeah, I said slowly, trying to picture how we'd do it. I had no clue, but Augie probably did. Or we could use a tarp for a flap, he said. That sounds quicker, I said. Yeah, said Augie. Come on, let's each grab a piece of this metal. We started dragging the metal sheets towards the entrance of the yard. They were pretty thin, so they weren't heavy. But each one looked to be about eight feet long and four feet wide. So it got kind of tricky maneuvering them through all the junk. Plus, we had to keep handling the edges very carefully, which were really sharp. When we finally got back to Al's office, Unc had arrived, and he and Al were setting up their checkerboard and chairs outside. Okay, if we take these? Augie asked Al. Be my guest, said Al. And I took some rope, Augie added. Is that okay? Sure. Oh, and do you have any tarps? For crying out loud, said Al. What do I look like, a junk dealer? Then he banged his palm against his forehead. Oh, yeah. I forgot for a second there. I am a junk dealer. This amused him so much it took him a while to recover. Tarps, he gasped at last. I think they're all being used, but hey, you want a tarp? Ask a painter. He gestured towards Unk. Oh yeah, I got tarps. All sizes and shapes. Plastic, canvas, vinyl, you name it. Awesome, said Augie. Could we have one? I mean, borrow one? We'll bring it back at the end of the summer. Unk echoed Al. Be my guest. Go see your aunt. I think she's making brownies today. We decided to get the roof materials out of the fort first. It was even tougher dragging the sheets of tin through the woods than it was moving them out of the junkyard. Then they kept getting hung up on the underbrush and low branches. When we got to the fort and eyeballing the roof material next to the wall, we saw that we needed two more sheets, so we headed back to Al's. As we were struggling along with our final haul, I felt the metal slipping from my sweaty grasp. I adjusted my hand to get a better grip and felt a burning pain as the metal sliced open my palm near the base of my thumb. Somehow, I remembered for Augie's sake not to swear. Dropping my tin, I hollered, Mamma mia, ay caramba, pasta fazu. I was vaguely aware of Augie laughing hysterically as I sucked away the blood to get a better look. Immediately, I felt like puking. I was looking at the inside of my hand, like the guts of my hand. And that stuff's supposed to be on the inside of the skin and out of sight because it's really totally disgusting and gross. Augie, may, Augie must have seen my face because he got to his feet with a look of concern. Sorry, Wyatt, he said, getting a hold of himself. You okay? Yeah, I said, but I heard my voice coming out kind of wobbly. Is it bad? Augie asked. Should we have Graham look at it? I hesitated. I don't think so. I wasn't sure, really, but we were so close to finishing the fort, we had to have our first sleep out that night. I just need something to stop the bleeding. Augie looked down at his t-shirt. This thing is really old, he said, and ripped off a strip from around the bottom. Pointing at my wound, he said, let me see that. I held out my hand, and he wrapped the cloth around it several times, going around my thumb to leave it free. When he tucked it in the end, oh, then he tucked it in the end. It was a pretty neat job, and it didn't hurt too much. Mostly, I was just glad I didn't have to look at it anymore. Using a little extra care, we got the rest of the tin to the fort. Augie sized up the situation and said we needed to add boards to the front walls to make them a little higher in the back. So we did that. Then we laid a final board across the front and back to make a ceiling beam. We hoisted up the sheets of tin, overlapping them so they'd fit, and so the edges wouldn't leak. If it rained, the water would run downhill in the corrugated ridges and off the back. Genius, I said. We nailed the edges of the roof down to keep it from blowing away, and then we went to get the tarp at Unk's house. Aunt Hilda was kneeling on the ground, weeding her garden when we got there. She waved and we went over. I was holding my hand behind my back so she wouldn't see it, because if she was anything like my mom, she'd make a ginormous stink about it and want to do the whole first aid thing or even drag me to the hospital. Augie told her what Unk had said about borrowing a tarp. My hands are for filthy, she said, waving them in the air so she could, so we could see. You boys go in and help yourselves to brownies and milk and take any tarp you'd like. Inside, as we ate, I said, too bad we didn't bring that owl. We could have snuck him back into the attic, no problem. Yeah, no problem except for him not having a head, Augie replied. Yeah, what are we going to do about that? 
I'm thinking super glue, Augie said confidently. I wasn't convinced that super glue was going to work, but I didn't say anything. Maybe he was right. I hope so. On the way out, I forgot about hiding my hand. Some blood had seeped through the t-shirt bandages and Aunt Helda spotted it. Wyatt, what on earth happened to you? Come over here and let me see that hand of yours. Augie and I exchanged a look, but there was no way out of it. It's not too bad, I say. She hustled us right back inside, asking a million questions about what happened. And was the metal rusty? A little. And had I had a tetanus shot? I had no idea, but I said, oh, yes. Aunt Hilda washed her hands at the kitchen sink and came back from the bathroom with her arms full of bandages, gauze, special little scissors, and a bottle of what I really hoped wasn't alcohol, but it was. She unwrapped the strip, strip of t-shirt, scolding all the while about how it wasn't a proper bandage, but in a nice way. She picked up the alcohol in a gauze pad. Then she moved in very close and bent her head down. This is going to sting, Wyatt, so you'll need to be very brave. Think about something else for a minute. Something that makes you happy, she went on. Are you ready, she asked. Not quite, I said, thinking my happy thoughts. Now, she asked. I guess so, I said. It was over much too soon. When she'd finished disinfecting, it was over much too soon. When she'd finished disinfecting, Aunt Hilda examined the cut and decided I did not require stitches. Next, she applied a bandage she called a butterfly, which would hold the two sides of open flesh in place so they could heal together. Then she wrapped gauze over that, taped it in place, and patted my hand with a warm smile. Dazed and nearly speechless, I managed to thank her. She sent us on our way with the rest of the brownies wrapped in foil. Back at the fort, we tucked the tarp under the tin along the front edge. Then we positioned it so it hung almost to the ground and nailed it in place. Augie hammered a couple of big spikes into the front roof board and attached a piece of rope to each one. We rolled up the tarp and tied it there. If it's raining, or we're doing something, you know, top secret, we just undo the ropes and... Augie demonstrated and the flat fell. I crawled underneath it into the fort. It's really dark in here with that down, I called. We're going to need flashlights. Augie rolled up the flap. It'll probably be up most of the time, he said, but yeah, we definitely need lights. Occasionally, munching on Aunt Hilda's brownies, we spent the rest of the day riding back and forth from our houses to Owls, where we piled our supplies, sleeping bags, flashlights, cards, comics, a couple fishing poles, and matches in a little baggie to keep them dry. Graham gave us some old enamel plates and cups, silverware, a heavy, a super heavy cast iron frying pan, an empty gallon milk jug, and some duct tape. I asked about those last two, but Augie said he'd show me later. At my house, we got a, we got food. A jar of peanut butter, a loaf of bread, granola bar, Slim Jims, two bags of Oreos, the world's best cookie, we both agreed. Cheese sticks, some apples and pears, a bag of red licorice sticks, my personal favorite. Augie likes black better, but we didn't have any and some bottles of pop and water. Augie rummaged in the refrigerator and took out a plastic tub of butter. Do you think your dad would mind if we take this? He asked. I doubt it, I said. What for? For frying stuff. I looked at our collection of food. I never had fried Slim Jims before, but now that I thought about it, I bet they'd probably taste good. Augie grabbed some salt and pepper and added it to the pile. We put it all in our backpacks. I wrote a note for dad and left it in the kitchen counter. On the kitchen counter. I took the rest of the notepad and some pens and put them in my backpack too. What's that for? Augie asked, writing down ideas for a song for Gerard. Augie nodded solemnly. Excellent. All day long, we had to keep our eyes peeled for J.R. and Maury. On the way back to Al's, we had a pretty close call. I spied them getting on their bikes in front of the convenience store near Augie's house and called to Augie. J.R. and Maury ahead. Take evasive action. We turned down a street and pedaled away without them seeing us. We bumped fists as we rode side by side. But then it was about four o'clock in the afternoon, and we were finally ready to start taking stuff out to the woods. Al and Unc had been watching with great interest as the pile grew and had made some useful suggestions and a few contributions, like two lawn chairs, even more beat up than the ones they were sitting on, and two orange crates to use as a table and a shelf. You want to take this too, Al said, unrolling a small square of linoleum and displaying it for us to see. What for? asked Augie. You never slept on the ground before? Not really, we both admitted. Yeah, well, I have, Al declared. It's hard and damp. Put this down. You'll thank me tonight. We thanked him right then. Unc, who had been listening, remarked, That joint gets any fancier, I might ask to move in. By that time, we were about to haul our last load out to the fort. It was close to six o'clock. Al and Unc were packing up for the night. We start our bikes out of sight inside the fence, and Al locked up. Have fun, boys, Unc said. 
Yeah, said Al, have fun. And if you hear some blo really blood-curdling screams tonight, like somebody's heart is getting ripped out by a wild animal while they're still alive, don't worry about it. I hear stuff all the time when I'm here late, and I don't believe those old stories for a minute. Augie and I stared at each other. Old stories, I repeated. What old stories? Augie asked. Unk broke in then. Now, Al, don't go trying to scare these boys. Who's trying to scare them? Al protested indig indignantly. Didn't I just say if you hear something horrible, don't worry about it? Don't worry about it. Pay no attention to this fool, said Unk. Just go and have a good time. Augie and I started walking towards the woods. Behind us, we could hear Al laughing and Unk scolding him. He was messing with us, right? I asked. Totally, said Augie. He made the whole thing up, I said. I never heard any stories like that before. Nothing to worry about. Heck no. We were quiet for a while. I don't know about Augie, but all I could think about was not thinking about what Al had said. Augie got us back on track. Dude, he said, we're about to camp out in the most awesome fort ever. <laughs> Heck yeah, we are, I said. When we reached the fort, we dropped the stuff we were carrying. I stretched my back and said, what do we do now? How about we get some squirrels for dinner? Augie asked. Heck yeah, I said. I've never hunted squirrels before or eaten one, but now we're really getting down to it. This was exactly the kind of thing I'd imagined you did when you had a fort. How do we get them? Augie reached into one of the giant pockets of his cargo shorts and took out a slingshot. Meet the squirrel slayer. No way, I said. You've actually gotten squirrels with that thing? Sure, Augie said. Ask Graham. I didn't have to ask Graham. If Augie said he'd slingshotted squirrels, I believe him. Let me see that, I said. Augie tossed it to me and I checked it out. It was a Y-shaped stick with thick rubber strips going from the tips of the Y to the leather pouch. Did you make this? I asked. Yeah, he said, sounding surprised. They're 34 bucks at the store. Does it really shoot? Augie grinned. Shoots good. I'm telling you, that Augie. Then I thought of something. Why don't we use your pellet gun? Augie shrugged. Too easy. For you, maybe, I said. So anyway, what do squirrels taste like? Good, like squirrel. How do we get them? First, said Augie, we need ammo. He leaned down and picked up a small roundish pebble. We continued walking, eyes on the ground, occasionally picking up a pebble with the right shape and pocketing it. We should probably hurry, Augie said, glancing up at the sun. Squirrels are out in the daytime, not at night. Let's hope they're ready to have a little snack before they turn in. He led the way to some pine trees and found a pine cone. See how a squirrel's been eating the nuts out of this? They love these things. We have to be still and hope he comes back with a few of his buddies. We crawled under some low-hanging branches and sat. We gotta stay really still, Augie whispered. We may have to wait a while, so get comfortable. If you see one, whisper to me. Don't stare at it. Just kind of look at it out of the corner of your eye. He got out the slingshot, pulled back the pouch, and tested his aim. Still whispering, he said, squirrels always pull the same trick. They run around the side of the tree and freeze where they think you can't see them. So hang on to this. He handed me a stone about twice the size as the one in the pouch of his slingshot. When I tell you, chuck it to the other side of the tree. Okay, I whispered back. We sat there still and quiet as anything. I'd never really just sat in the woods like that and it was pretty cool until a bunch of little flies started buzzing around my face. One landed on my nose. I wanted to swat at it in the worst way. Augie must have read my mind because he hissed, stay still. I sat as quietly as I could, quietly as I could, remembering a movie I saw where Indians buried a guy all except his head and ants came around and crawled all over his face and he couldn't brush them away or anything since his arms were buried. buried. Goodness. But he wanted to prove to the Indians he was tough. So he never twitched, even though they were biting ants. Next thing I knew, a line of ants were crawling on me. And even though my arms were free, Augie had said I couldn't move. So I watched as they trooped right over my outstretched leg, like that was their usual route. And whatever this thing was that was in the way wasn't going to stop them from following it. They didn't bite, but they did tickle like crazy. It seemed like a long time went by. Then I heard a rustle. Something was coming our way through the dead needles on the ground. Then it stopped. Then a scamper, scamper, scamper. Stop. Scamper, scamper, scamper. Stop. I slanted my eyes in that direction, and sure enough, there was a squirrel sitting up on its hind legs, eyes darting everywhere, nose sniffing like mad. Then, scamper, scamper, scamper. Jump. It leaped into the pine tree and quickly ran around the other side of the trunk, out of sight, just the way Augie had said it would. 
My heart was pounding like crazy. I slid my eyes towards Augie and lifted my eyebrows in a question. Now? Augie raised the slingshot into position and gave me a little grin and nodded. I threw the rock so it landed on the other side of the pine tree. I guess the squirrels thought we'd moved and could see... I'm sorry. I guess the squirrels thought we'd moved and could see it now, so it ran around our side of the trunk. Augie let the stone fly, and the squirrel dropped to the ground and was still. I couldn't believe it. It was like Augie was some kind of squirrel wizard or something. Or like he had made a robot squirrel that did exactly what he told it to do. Woohoo! I shouted. We got to our feet and went over to examine the squirrel. It looked kind of peaceful, like it was sleeping. I examined its long, bushy tail, its little clawed feet, and round ears, and pushed open its mouth to see what kind of teeth it had. Wow, check these out, I said, showing Augie the four long, sharp front teeth. Two on the bottom, two on the top. They're orange. Weird, huh? Like a beaver, said Augie. If you keep one for a pet, you have to trim those teeth or they just keep growing. This was interesting. Really? Forever? Augie nodded. So, like the teeth would just grow right up into its brain, I said. Yep, Augie said cheerfully. And the top ones would turn into giant fangs? Yep. I was picturing that when Augie handed me the slingshot. Your turn. Okay. I'd never handled a slingshot before. Forget about shooting a squirrel with one. But it had actually looked pretty easy when Augie did it. Not that I'd actually seen what he did, but it had been so quick. So we, so we sat back down in our same positions. Only Augie had the chucking rock and I had the slingshot. It seemed to take longer this time. And I was beginning to get restless and my stomach was growling so loud I figured every squirrel in the woods could hear it. When suddenly I heard the same, scamper, 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 stop. Scamper, 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 stop. A squirrel was rummaging around on the ground. It found a pine cone, held it in his paws, pulled off the scales, and started chomping on the nuts. I looked at Augie out of the corner of my eye. Was I supposed to shoot now or wait until it went up the tree? Augie nodded and moved his lips soundlessly. Now. I had slowly slumped down while we were waiting, so I kind of had to wiggle up to get in position. The squirrel froze. I froze. After a long time, the squirrel began munching again, only it looked nervous. I raised the slingshot, real sneaky-like, pulled back the pouch. It was harder to pull than I expected, and the white part started wobbling as I tried to figure out how to aim. The squirrel turned, and I swear, it frowned at me for a few seconds. Then it was gone. Too late. My stone flew and landed about four feet away, nowhere near where the squirrel had been. Jeez, I said, that stunk. Augie shrugged, putting the slingshot in his pocket and picking up his squirrel by the tail. No sweat. You know how many times I've shot this thing? Come on, we'll clean this at the stream. We, I thought. Luckily, Augie cleaned while I watched. He took a pocket knife, cut off the tail, and then made a few more careful cuts. Then he tugged a few times, and it was like he slipped the critter out of its fur coat, slick as a whistle. Then he pulled out the guts. The squirrel looked oddly human now. It's kind. It kind of looks like a pygmy, I said, a dead pygmy. A naked, headless, armless, footless pygmy, I added. Augie laughed and started cutting the body into pieces for frying. He, no he nodded towards the skin and guts. Why don't you bury those, bury those over there someplace? Sure. Hey, I said, holding up the tail. Maybe I'll keep this? I was picturing attaching it to my bike's handlebar or to the back of a baseball hat. Or even, hey, we could fly it from the fort like a flag. We could, said Augie. We'll have to boil it and salt it, though, or it'll start to stink. Oh, uh, yeah, like with mummies, right? Didn't they use salt on them? Augie shrugged. I decided to bury the tail. I didn't have a shovel, and digging a hole with a stick didn't work so great. Then I spotted, spotted a fairly big rock half buried in the ground and got an idea. I pried it up, dropped the tail and the pelt and the guts into the hole and it hole it left and covered it back up, sort of, with the rock. At the fort, we got set up. There were leaves and twigs on the ground inside the fort, and we brushed them out the doorway. Threw out all the rocks we could feel, then we laid out Al's linoleum which was a small, was, was a little small, but covered a good part of the ground. When we'd spread out our sleeping bags and set up the orange crates with our other stuff, the place looked great. Then we gathered wood, cleared an area in front of the fort, and started a fire, which was easy with all the dry pine needles and twigs around. Augie took the empty gallon jug and a cup and headed towards the stream. When he came back, I saw he'd filled the jug with water, which seemed like a good idea with the blazing fire and all. But the flame, when the flames died down a little, we put two big rocks on either side of the fire and balanced the frying pan on top. I threw in a gob of margarine, or butter. When it was sizzling, Augie put in the pieces of meat and I sprinkled salt and pepper on them. The smell of frying meat was incredible. We ate some cheese sticks while we, started, while we stared hungrily at the pan, turning the pieces of meat from time to time. 
When I was about to die of starvation, Augie declared the meat was done. We sat in the drifting smoke from the fire, gnawing squirrel meat off the bones and slathering slices of bread with margarine. What did I tell you? Augie asked. You said it would be good, I answered. He looked at me surprised. You don't like it? He shrugged. Oh, well, more for me then. He reached over and grabbed the remaining two pieces from the pan. Not so fast, I said, taking one of them back. You said it was good, but this, this is epic. This is the best meal I've ever had in my whole life. The best ever. I stuffed a whole slice of bread in my mouth for emphasis. Augie grinned. Yeah? I mean, you've been to some really fancy restaurants, right? I nodded, but repeated with my mouth full. Uh, buff, of a. This cracked us both up, and then I laughed with my whole mouth full of bread kind of shot. I'm sorry. This cracked us both up, and when I laughed, my whole mouth full of bread kind of shot out right at Augie. He threw it back at me, and I picked it up and finished it. We chewed every shred of meat off the bones, licked our fingers clean, and finished it all off with some Oreos and licorice. The nice white bandage Aunt Hilda had wrapped around my thumb was pretty dirty from all the work we'd done, and greasy now, too, so I pulled it off and threw it in the fire. The cut had some dried blood on it and still hurt a little, but not so much. It had gotten pretty dark then, so we piled more wood on the fire and Augie got out the calendar we swiped from Al. Even with the fire built up, it was kind of hard to see. Augie got a flashlight and rummaged around for a minute. He came back with the milk jug filled with water and the duct tape, pressed the lit end of the flashlight against the side of the jug. Hold this here while I tape it, he told me. The beam of light shining through the jug made the whole thing glow. Like a lantern, I said, so that's why you brought that stuff. Graham and I do this whenever the power goes out. Augie explained, which happens a lot. I sat back and admired the lantern. It seemed to me that Augie knew how to do everything, everything important anyway. For a second, the question popped into my head. What am I good at? No answer came to mind. I shrugged the thought away. We sat by the fire going through the calendar, month by month, examining the pictures by the light of the lantern. There was a lot, of, there was a lot to discuss. One thing we agreed on for sure was that when we were old enough to drive, we were going to own pickup trucks. When the fire died down, we doused the embers until they were cold and got ready for bed. We left the flap open and lay back on our sleeping bags, looking out at the stars shining through the tree branches and shooting the breeze. After a while, we grew quiet. I wish we could live out here all the time, I said. Hmm, said Augie. I could tell Augie was just about to sleep, and so was I. But I fought to stay awake, thinking how this was the best night of my life, and I didn't want to miss any of it. That is the end of chapter five. So I am going to do chapter six in another video. Chapter six is really short and so is chapter seven. I might do those two together. Um, and then I'm going to get everything posted and share them with you guys from YouTube. Thanks. See you later.